Thank you, Annie and you, Anne, for such a nice introduction. And uh, I'm thrilled to be here today. Uh, as they've noted, I'm going to talk about what is the optimal dietary pattern for CVD risk reduction. And um, I'll cover these topics. First, we're going to look at the health landscape of the nation. And you're going to see it's, it's pretty alarming. And then we'll talk about current dietary recommendations that are targeted specifically to reduce cardiovascular disease risk. And then I'm going to talk about some of the clinical studies that we've been doing at Penn State. And we have a canola oil multicenter intervention trial. Um, we've completed the first one and we're starting a second follow-up study. Talk a little bit about a grain study we did, an avocado study, and the DREAM study. And then we'll sum it all up. Okay, what's the health landscape in the United States? Well, we know that cardiovascular disease uh, for both men and women is a leading cause of death and disability, and then cancer is second. Then there are a lot of other causes, including accidents, lung diseases, diabetes, and Alzheimer's disease, but by far, cardiovascular disease as well as cancer are leading causes for both men and women. If we look at the WHO Global Burden of Disease Study, what we see is that things have really changed between 1990 and 2010 in terms of the world's top 12 health problems. In 1990, you see a lot of infectious diseases listed, whereas in 2010, what we see is at the top three, two are chronic diseases, and they're cardiovascular diseases, ischemic disease and stroke. So let's look at some of the, the other major problems in the United States. Well, obesity. And about 35, 36% of our population, men and women, are obese. And you can see here that for women, uh, the trend has been pretty stable from uh, around 2000 to 2010, whereas men, it has increased. Now for men, we don't see where it's leveling off yet. Particularly alarming to nutritionists is what we see in terms of childhood obesity. And so you can see here that 8.1% of infants and toddlers, infants and toddlers up to age two are overweight and 17% of two to 19 year olds are obese. And you can see what the um, statistics are for adults. They match what I showed on the previous slide. So these are very recent data that just came out of CDC. And you know it's alarming to me to see that these little toddlers, um, there's a problem there already in almost 10%. Uh, we see what's happened with diabetes over the years, from 1980 to 2009. And this is something that's very alarming as well. And particularly alarming to me is the incidence of prediabetes. And so that we know that there are about 79 million uh, adults, ages 30 years and older, who have prediabetes. And we know that they're on the track to getting diabetes. but. Look at this. Uh, this is especially alarming. 50% of people 65 years and older have prediabetes. With our aging population, this is only going to increase. Now, this is an interesting slide, and uh, it was published in 2013. And what we see is that it looks like the prevalence of metabolic syndrome is actually decreasing. Well, why is that? We see that waist circumference, the components, you know, are changing very differently. So that um, even though waist circumference is increasing, some of the other criteria are decreasing. And in particular, we see maybe some decreases in blood pressure. That's probably because of pharmacological control. Triglycerides seem to be decreasing a little bit. Maybe that's because we're eating a higher fat diet compared to before. HDL cholesterol, well, maybe this is due to the higher fat diet. And then what we see here is with blood glucose, kind of interesting, some uh, recent decreases, perhaps related to pharmacotherapy. So um, when we look at top 12 risk factors 
of the global burden of disease, what we see with that little red star is that many are related to nutritional practices. It, it's just amazing to see that. High blood pressure, uh, alcohol consumption, low fruit consumption, high body mass index, high glucose, low body weight, high salt intake, and low nut and seed consumption. And then others are related to lifestyle too, like inactivity and cigarette smoking. So there's a lot that we can do with nutrition and other lifestyle practices to decrease the global burden of disease worldwide. So um, in 2010, the American Heart Association re, uh, released dietary goals with the intent of decreasing cardiovascular disease 20% by the year 2020. And here they are. Eat more fruits and vegetables, eat more fish, fiber-rich whole grains, decrease sodium, and watch those sugar-sweetened beverages. Secondary goals include eating more nuts, legumes, and seeds, eating uh, less processed meat, mainly because of the sodium, and then decreasing saturated fat to less than 7% of calories. And you've heard these recommendations before. They reflect recommendations that are coming out by a lot of government organizations and other health organizations as well. Well, how are we doing in meeting um, you know, goals to reduce heart disease risk factor? And if we look at um, some of these, these target areas like smoking, body mass index, physical activity, healthy diet, cholesterol, blood pressure, and glucose, what we can see is that we've made a lot of progress with a lot of these targets. Now, none is perfect, but look here in terms of smoking. You can see 76% of our population isn't smoking. Body mass index, well, you know, there are a lot of people who have, you know, a normal body mass index. Physical activity, uh, there's a lot of green there. And then uh, green with cholesterol, blood pressure, and glucose. Although you can see we have to make progress in these areas. But what's really striking here is healthy dietary practices. And what this shows is that only 0.3% of the population, that means everybody here in this room, is <laughs> following a good diet. But 79% of the population is you know, way far away from meeting current dietary recommendations. So we've got a lot of work to do. So I thought I would talk about the research that we're doing at Penn State and go over some current studies that we've been involved with. The first is um, the COMET study. Co COMET is the acronym for Canola Oil Multicenter Intervention Trial. And what we did is looked at modification of diet fatty acid quality toward an optimal N6 and N9 fatty acid profile along with short and long chain omega-3 fatty acids. And uh, we used novel oil blends and looked at effects on cardiovascular risk factors. So this was a multi-center study. Um, it was initiated by colleagues at, in Canada, mainly at the University of Manitoba, under the leadership of Peter Jones, but also with uh, Benoit Lamarche at the University of Laval and Dr. David Jenkins at the University of Toronto. But we were so lucky to be part of this particular project. And there are many objectives that were addressed in the COMET study. And the two that I'm going to talk about are one and three. Examine alterations in plasma lipids and lipoproteins and inflammatory cytokines. And then examine changes in body composition using DEXA scanning on these different diets. So uh, we tested uh, five different oils or oil blends within the context of a diet that provided about 35% calories from fat. And you can see that the macronutrient composition is representative of current recommendations. So for fat, we recommend between 20, 25% to 35% of calories. Um, the oils that we studied are shown on this slide, canola oil, uh, fat, high oleic canola oil, high oleic canola oil, plus DHA, 
a corn safflower oil blend and a flax safflower oil blend. And um, you can see the, the uh, major fatty acid class emphasized by each of these oils. So um, there are three that were high in monos and two that were high in uh, polyunsaturated fats. Uh, one that was high in N6 poly um, and the other one that was high in ALA. And then you can see here that um, the high oleic canola oil uh, was high in DHA. So that all of our test diets were low in saturated fat. They provided less than 7% of calories from saturated fat. Three were high in monos at the expense of polys. You can see how polys were switched out for monos in these two oil blend diets. And then um, three, um, okay, three were higher in polys, um, basically at the expense of monos here in uh, the high oleic acid diets. So this is uh, the experimental design. Um, again, you know, we tested five different oils, oil blends. Um, we used a double blind, randomized, controlled feeding design. And um, every subject was on uh, each diet for a period of four weeks with about a four week washout in between each diet period. And so the oils were provided as smoothies and shakes. And so that the diets had similar foods, but the only thing that differed was the oil that was delivered via a smoothie. So very, very well controlled diet design. And our subjects were representative of the average American and average Western population. They were between 25 and 20 and 65 years of age. And BMI was between 22 to 40 kilograms per meter squared, but they had to have an increased waist circumference defined by the International Diabetes Association criteria, not ATP3. And then they had to have at least one criteria for metabolic syndrome, high glucose, low HDL, high triglycerides, or blood pressure. So they, they didn't necessarily have, have metabolic syndrome. Some did, but certainly they were at risk. And I think the key thing here is that, um, there's, I know there's a lot on this slide, but all the diets improved total cholesterol and LDL cholesterol. The uh, canola oil diet with DHA increased HDL and had the greatest triglyceride lowering effect. There are some other little differences here, but overall, all the diet blends you know, favorably affected major risk factors for cardiovascular disease and maybe the canola DHA oil did better. Certainly, that was the oil that did better for blood pressure. It decreased both diastolic and systolic blood pressure compared to um, baseline, certainly. And it wasn't significantly different, but uh, certainly a little bit more so than the other oils did. So that then when we looked at Framingham 10-year risk score, it was much better with the canola DHA diet compared with all the other treatment group. Despite this though, all the other oils did decrease Framingham 10-year risk score, but there was one that proved to be far superior. Okay, now I wanna talk about something really new and exciting. And uh, Sharon Liu, a graduate student in my program, um, looked at body composition in response to the different diet treatments. And so in this particular study, we used uh, DEXA to look at uh, visceral adipose tissue or you know, um, the android fat mass, and we looked at gonoid fat mass as well. And interestingly, what we found is that the canola oil diet and the high oleic canola oil treatment uh, lowered visceral adipose tissue compared with the flax safflower oil diet. And this is a, an exciting new finding. Uh, there is some evidence in the literature to show that monounsaturated fat 
does in fact decrease visceral adipose tissue. Um, uh, in the PREDIMED study, there's um, some evidence that the nut diet after one year, a Mediterranean diet with nuts, decreased uh, waist circumference compared with a control uh, low-fat, high-carb diet. So um, also, um, let's see, the high oleic canola oil diet uh, decreased the android to gynoid fat mass ratio compared with the flax safflower oil diet. So we tried to understand why this was happening, and so we looked at fatty acid ethanolamines. And these are lipid mediators, um, and what we know is that, especially with oleoethanolamide right here, uh, there's some evidence in animal studies that it has an anorexic effect, and that really didn't come into play in our study because we controlled calories perfectly. But then uh, there is some evidence, too, for increased energy expenditure with high oleoethanolamides circulating. And we didn't really look at that, um, but we have a second study that we're working on that we've just started now to look at energy expenditure in response to high mono diets. But this basically shows that you know, the fatty acids uh, are converted to ethanolamides, and in fact, certain ones, the oleo one, may affect energy expenditure, and we think it's affecting body composition. And in fact, um, what we see here is that uh, on two diets, the canola oil diet and the high oleic canola oil diet, the oleo ethanolamines were increased compared with the other uh, treatment groups. And um, interestingly, on the, the o, uh, high oleic DHA oil, there was an increase in DHEA. But basically, um, in a small subgroup that we had data on, we saw uh, that, that um, there was, you could see as the oleoethanolamide concentration increased in the plasma, there was a greater decrease in android fat mass. Now, the one thing that uh, we're just scratching our heads over is that there was a significant relationship with the corn sap group as well. So I don't know what this means, but certainly in the canola uh, oleic acid group, we see this relationship. So um, we have a second study now ongoing to try and sort this out a little bit better. But we think that um, a high mono diet, uh, and this was the highest uh, mono fat, a uh, high oleic, DA, high oleic corn oil, I'm sorry, high oleic canola oil uh, elicited the greatest reduction in visceral adipose tissue and uh, it caused an, an increase in um, oleoethanolamide and uh, you know, we're not sure why this is happening. But it's an interesting finding. So interestingly, we found that changes in abdominal fat mass correlated with decreases in triglycerides, so those people who had decreases in visceral adipose tissue also had decreases in triglycerides. People who had decreases in abdominal fat mass also had decreases in systolic blood pressure and diastolic blood pressure. So we're in the process of writing this paper up, and um, it'll be submitted very soon. Hopefully, it'll get accepted. So in terms of overall conclusions, what we see is that all the test oils, they were um, high in unsaturated fat, polys and monos, uh, decreased the Framingham risk score. Uh, but the one that was high in DHA uh, gave a better Framingham risk score, mainly because of better effects on triglycerides and blood pressure. The diets high in monos, the ones that were um, the, the canola oil, and the high oleic canola oil, but not the DHA oil, uh, improved adipose tissue distribution and decreased visceral adipose tissue, possibly due to these ethanolamine effects. And then we saw benefits of 
reducing adipose tissue mass on uh, triglycerides and blood pressure. So, you know, we think that maybe uh, monounsaturated fats, uh, which, you know, is a core component of the Mediterranean diet, might elicit beneficial effects through effects on body composition, through effects on maybe calorie intake, which in turn might beneficially affect cardiovascular disease risk factor. Okay, so let's move on to a couple of other studies that we've done. Uh, talk a little bit about Tina Harris's study, uh, looking at the effects of whole and refined grains in the context of a weight loss diet on cardiometabolic risk factors, including abdominal adipose tissue and also subcutaneous adipose tissue. So Tina is now doing a postdoc at uh, University of Colorado in Denver with Jim Hill. So our main study hypothesis was that a diet rich in whole grains will elicit greater improvements in cardiometabolic risk factors than a diet rich in refined grains. And a secondary hypothesis is that a diet rich in whole grains will elicit a greater decrease in visceral adipose tissue than a diet rich in refined grains. And so that we had done a previous whole grain study and actually showed benefits on visceral adipose tissue in you know, a very small group of subjects. So we wanted to rev it up and uh, do just a, a much better study where we uh, controlled the diet better than previously. So all in all, we studied 24 males and 25 females. But for um, this particular sub-study, uh, we only got, uh, this was a parallel arm study. We only got 12 people on the refined grain group to agree to this MRI analysis and 16 people on the whole grain group to agree on going through the tube, as we called it. This is, you know, daunting for a lot of people. There are some people who, you know, were really scared of this instrumentation for all sorts of different reasons. So not everybody agreed to do this. So that's why, you know, I'm going to re be reporting on the whole group, but also for visceral adipose tissue data only on a small subgroup. And these are people who had increased waist circumference. One nice thing about doing a controlled feeding study is that we could, in fact, control their diet very well. And what you see here is that our test diets were exactly the same with the exception of refined grains being provided on the refined grain diet and whole grains being repla re re uh, replacing refined grains on the whole grain diet. So everything else was the same. So with our previous study that we did, um, patients were on, our subjects were on self-selected diets and um, you know, they thought there was something magical with the whole grains that we gave them. And so if they didn't eat their eight servings per day at nine o'clock at night, then they ate the last six servings before they went to bed. And we thought, no, we're going to really control everything to see if there truly is an effect of whole grains, especially on visceral adipose tissue. And so this, this does show that the whole grain diet, um, you know, had all whole grains. It provided uh, additional fiber, mainly from the whole grains, uh, lots of insoluble fiber. And you can see it provided more magnesium than the refined grain diets do mainly to the refined grains that were incorporated in the diet. And um, this was a weight loss study. And the main finding is, you know, big differences in fasting blood glucose levels despite similar weight loss between the two treatment groups. And you can see the big differences here uh, in fasting blood glucose. And what I think is really a nice finding, interesting finding, is that for our subjects who had prediabetes, Despite weight loss, um, you know, there really wasn't a decrease in blood glucose levels in the refined group, whereas in the whole grain group, we basically cured prediabetes with weight loss and whole grain. And so this shows that because it was controlled feeding, they did achieve a similar weight loss, which is one limitation of this particular study. And you can see the difference in... Uh, abdominal fat 
between the two groups, again measured by MRI, very sensitive technique to measure visceral adipose tissue, no significant differences. Maybe a trend, but probably not. But then when we looked at you know, comparisons to baseline, what we saw is that the whole grain group, the whole grain diet, significantly decreased visceral adipose tissue compared to baseline, um, whereas a, you know, the refined diet tended to. But there really was no significant difference between um, these two treatment groups. So we can't really say that whole grains reduce visceral adipose tissue. I'd really love to do this study again. What ended up happening is that we had a lot of people in our study who really didn't have exclusive uh, visceral adiposity. Uh, a lot of them had you know, an increase in subcutaneous adipose tissue. So we measured waist circumference, basically with a tape. And um, you know, I think that maybe if I could do this again, uh, I would just pre-screen individuals and look at those that truly have an increased waist circumference due to visceral adipose tissue, not an increase in subcutaneous tissue. So, uh, but you know, we looked at this in every which way possible, and uh, basically. Um, you know, we, we saw that with, you know, an increase in whole grain consumption as measured by alkalosorcinol uh, that's found in whole grains, there was, you know, a greater decrease in abdominal adipose tissue. But, and, and this was statistically significant, but then there was an insignificant increase in sub-Q adipose tissue. So does that mean that there was a redistribution in the abdominal area of adipose tissue from the visceral depot to the sub-Q depot. Well, this wasn't significant, and this was. So um, I think, you know, we're still left scratching our heads. Does, uh, do whole grains decrease visceral adipose tissue? There are some trends here, some suggestions, but we can't really say definitively. Okay, and then we basically showed that uh, only changes in insulin correlated changes with changes in visceral adipose tissue, but my goodness, you know, changes in subcutaneous adipose tissue um, were correlated with lots of things, as you can see here. So with our grain study, what we saw is whole grains reduce visceral adipose tissue with weight loss versus baseline, but not more so than refined grains. And uh, these decreases in visceral adipose tissue are associated with decreases in fasting insulin. And I think the main finding here, without any doubt, is that whole grains basically cure prediabetes. In people who lose weight, um, be interesting to see without weight loss if that can happen as well. But the flip side of this is even with weight loss, refined grain group didn't have a decrease in glucose levels in those who had prediabetes. Okay, um, another study I wanted to talk about is our avocado study. And I was so pleased that we had an avocado snack uh, during our group discussion because you're gonna see the health benefits of it. So we looked at the effects of monounsaturated fatty acids from avocados and oils on established and emerging risk factors for cardiovascular disease. And so we evaluated the effect of a monounsaturated, enriched, moderate fat diet with and without one avocado per day on lipid lipoproteins, lipoprotein particle size, and classes. And what we really wanted to see is whether avocados bring to the diet certain bioactives that elicit benefits beyond monounsaturated fats. And so this is, you know, a sort of a unique study design in that our avocado diet and our moderate fat diet were matched for macronutrients and fatty acids. And then we had a low fat diet that also was low in saturated fat, but higher in carbohydrate compared to these two moderate fat diets. Then we had an average American run-in diet. 
And this is, you know, basically the design that we always implement. Our subjects were on test diets for five weeks, and there was a two-week break. And we always implement a randomized, crossover, controlled feeding study. And all subjects are on all treatment diets. That really does help with the statistics, as you know. And so in terms of recruitment criteria, basically we really wanted people who were healthy, non-smoking, but overweight. Some people who were very representative of the average American. And they had moderately elevated LDL cholesterol levels between the 25th and 90th percentile. And basically, they couldn't have high blood pressure, but it could be controlled with drug therapy. They couldn't be on cholesterol-lowering meds, and they couldn't have had a heart disease, diabetes, etc. cetera. And we, they couldn't be a vegetarian or have food allergies. So we did advanced lipoprotein testing in this study, and we looked at all of the atherogenic ABOB-containing lipoproteins present in the fasting state. And these are those such lipoproteins right here. All the ABOB containing lipoproteins. And then we also looked at lipoprotein classes as well. So there's a lot of information on this slide, but the key thing to point out as an overview is that the avocado diet is shown in black. And I think the key comparison is to compare the black, both with the white and the gray. And what we see across the board is benefits of the avocado diet, especially over the moderate fat diet, indicating health benefits of the bioactive components in avocados on total cholesterol, LDL cholesterol. For HDL cholesterol, it wasn't decreased compared, compared to baseline compared to the other two treatments. Non-HDL cholesterol, all the bad lipoproteins, uh, much, benef much more beneficial effect of the avocado diet. And then the low-fat diet, as would be expected, increased triglycerides and the triglyceride-containing lipoproteins. But you can see here just benefits of the avocado diet compared to baseline with this little star here, uh, compared to the other treatments on all those ApoB bad, lipo bad lipoproteins. And so that then when we looked at um, um, you know, the clinical Im implications, i.e. predicted changes in coronary heart disease risk, um, the low-fat diet didn't do well because of the increase in the triglyceride-containing level <coughs> protein. The moderate-fat diet did well, but the avocado diet did better. Now, people keep asking, well, you know, Avocados are considered a fruit. Would you have seen the same benefits with other fruits and vegetables? Well, we didn't look at that, and that's a key question. Maybe all these other plant foods have these wonderful bioactives that um, elicit beneficial effects. And certainly, there's an emerging literature coming out showing health benefits of plant bioactives, such as coffee, on HDL function and then you know, other plant-based foods as well. So the key finding here is what happened in terms of all the bad lipoprotein. And what you see here is in terms of LDL 1 and 2, the large buoyant LDL. Now, all the diets did the same. But then when we look at the triglyceride-rich component, um, basically you see beneficial effects emerging for the avocado diet. But then with the small, dense LDL, clear benefits of the avocado diet. And then with the remnants, um, you know, benefits there too, with all the bioactives in avocados compared to the moderate fat diet. So this basically shows the added benefits of those plant bioactives. We haven't looked at what they are, but that I think would be a neat project in and of itself. So in conclusion, then, a moderate fat diet provided by an avocado a day achieved a more favorable lipid lipoprotein profile compared to a cholesterol lowering moderate fat diet with avo without avocados and lower fat diets. And you can see a greater reduction in all the atherogenic lipoproteins. 
Okay, this is the last study I want to tell you about, Mike Fox study. This was uh, funded by USDA, and Mike has currently uh, just accepted a new position at Soleil, and he started his job uh, July 1. So um, he looked at determinants of erythrocyte omega-3 fatty acids in response to fish oil supplementation, a dose-response randomized control trial. And so the primary objectives are just to examine the dose-response relationship of supplemental EPA and DHA on red blood cell fatty acid content in healthy adults. And then what's new is to identify predictors of the response. And so this paper was published in Journal of the American Heart, Heart, Asso Journal of the American Heart Association very recently. And so we wanted to see um, you know, if we could figure out, you know, um, different predictor of predictive factors, including age, sex, race, body weight, uh, physical activity level, and if that affected uh, the response of the supplements that we gave. This was a supplement study, and so that it could be well controlled, and we did free living individuals on their self-selected diet. And we gave them 0, 300, 600, 900, 1,800 milligrams a day of EPA, DHA. We got these supplements from Nordic Nat Natural. And it was a randomized trial. And um, subjects were on these particular supplements for a period of five months. And so this basically shows our subject characteristics um, they, these were young people, and we had uh, more males than females, and basically um, they were consuming about, um, you know, one fish meal a week. They were consuming about 100 milligrams of EPA and DHA per day with this particular omega-3 index. And this gives us uh, an indicator of the percent enrichment of omega-3 fatty acids in red blood cell membrane. And so at baseline, uh, all of our subjects were the same. They had, you know, basically a pretty low omega-3 fatty acid index. And then, as would be expected, there was a dose response enrichment in red blood cell fatty acids with increasing EPA DHA dose, as you can see here. And it, it was statistically significant. Um, when we did the comparisons. But what's new? This is expected, of course. If you give people more EPA and DHA, their red blood cell membranes are be going to become more enriched. And so this is what's new. And so that, what were predictors of response? And basically, what we found is people who had a lower body weight had a greater response, significantly greater response. So um, this then really does support recommendations to get people who are overweight and obese to lose weight. In terms of baseline omega-3 uh, fatty acid level, those who had the lowest intake had the greatest response. In terms of sex, females had the greatest response. Uh, in terms of age, older people responded more so than younger people. And then in terms of physical activity, people who were more physically active had a greater response to our supplements. And so um, basically, um, Mike came up with a multivariate regression equation to uh, figure out you know, the predictions here. And so I'm coming to the end. I think I have two more slides here. But where are we going now with all of this? And um, basically, what we re do we really want to establish a DRI for EPA and DHA? You know, the current American has uh, an omega-3 index that's very low. And this is associated with an increased risk of heart disease. And if we could get them into this intermediate range, uh, we could really decrease risk of heart disease Ideally, we'd like to have them higher up on this continuum here.
But basically what we showed is that with 250 to 500 milligrams a day, we can increase the omega-3 index by 1 to 2 percent. And that would, would bring people who are in a high-risk category into a, an intermediate category. And so uh, basically, you know, um, here's the equation that we came up with for figuring out, you know, how much EPA and DHA is needed to increase the omega-3 index. And just in terms of body weight, you can see uh, a lot of EPA and DHA is needed to increase this omega-3 index quite a bit. Okay, and actually, um, I forgot about these slides. I just added them. So just bear with me for just a couple of minutes. But this is the new direction of our research now. And we are, and this was part of this USDA grant, and that is um, we're looking at an in vivo model of inflammation and how uh, diet and nutrition can affect an inflammatory response. So we did, um, I'm just going to report on the pilot study. So in our USDA grant, we um, actually gave about 25 subjects out of that 125 we studied an LPS cha uh, challenge, an in vivo, low-dose uh, inflammatory challenge. And so I'm just going to talk to you today about this little pilot study that we did. Uh, we only had six subjects, as you see here, and it was a randomized crossover little study where they either got a placebo and in a second visit they got LPS or they got LPS first and the placebo. But this is really what our intent was, you know, for our USDA grant. I can talk to you about that. We did actually 24 subjects. So um, there is this person, Anthony Zeffardini at NIH, who is the master holder of LPS. And he does administer it very cautiously to people who want to study, you know, in vivo inflammatory challenges and effects of different interventions on that. And I really like this model a lot because I think it's a very realistic model and it's a very controlled model so that we looked at how can we elicit an inflammatory response in our subject? Well, we can give them a lot of saturated fat. You know, that's not really controlled. Well, we can have them exercise. Okay, that's not so controlled. Um, well, maybe we could have them go to the dentist and get their teeth cleaned, but then the inflammatory response the first time would be different from the inflammatory response subsequently. So then we, we found out that there's somebody down the road, Dan Rader and Murdoch Riley, who are doing this at UPenn. So we partnered with them, and they're helping us out with this. So it is a, a well-controlled model of systemic inflammation. And it's not like studying people who have raging inflammatory diseases, like inflammatory bowel disease, like rheumatoid arthritis. And we know that trying to do a nutrition intervention in them is like taking you know, a garden hose, putting out a raging forest fire. So this is something, you know, the, the inflammation that we all experience you know, throughout our lives deals with having a cold, uh, maybe eating too much saturated fat one time, just maybe getting you know, a viral infection or bacterial infection, what have you. But something that's, that's not just a raging inflammatory kind of disease um, that is really not mainstream. So our pilot study objectives were to determine the clinical effects of a low dose in vivo LPS challenge and then assess the inflammatory response. And that's just what I'm going to show you in that little study of N of 6 that we did. So um, four of our subjects had these mild flu-like symptoms. We had two people, they were the women, who had a greater response. Uh, one of them vomited and one of them spiked a fever. 
But in general, you know, these men just kind of said, oh, I just don't feel real good. I kind of feel crummy. I don't know what it is. And we monitored them for, you know, a, a good period of time, as you can see here. We did notice a change in heart rate 12, uh, for 12 hours post-injection of 0.06 nanograms per uh, kilogram, which is low. That's the lowest dose you can get of an inflammatory challenge. And we did notice um, beautiful responses with TNF-alpha. It peaked at two hours. And IL-6, it peaked at three hours. And then, you know, it went down by six hours and returned to normal. So now the key question is, for somebody who's on a nutrition intervention, can that blunt the response? Can that quicken the resolution to an inflammatory challenge? And so we have one study ongoing and another one in the pipeline. And that's kind of where our research is going. And with CRP, that peaked after 24 hours. So blunt the response, quicken the resolution. And that's what we're doing with you know, our USDA study. So what happened there, I'll just mention this real quickly, is we have banked samples on those 24 subjects. And um, we had the hardest time getting IND approval from FDA for this study. And it slowed us down for one whole year. And so we ran out of money to look at the lipid mediators and you know, the, the response there in those 24 subjects. But we're working on trying to get about $10,000 know, to make this happen. So we'll see. Uh, it, it's going to happen, but I think uh, the data are going to be slowly coming. My last slide. So um, EPA and DHA supplementation, dose dependently increased omega-3, and we identified predictors of the response. And um, you know, we can use these data to estimate individual needs to figure out omega-3 omega recommendations. So in summary, we know that diet affects multiple CVD risk factors. What I'm very excited about are our monounsaturated fat data. They may affect visceral adiposity with our whole grains. They may too. I think we didn't study it as best as we could. Uh, bioactives in avocados and maybe fruits and vegetables have important CVD benefits beyond the fatty acid profile. And we've been able to estimate the amount of dietary EPA and DHA for the optimal omega-3 index. With that, I thank you very much for your attention.